But once you reach the edge of the LZ, you might be 200 feet in the air because these are double canopy jungles. So you drop down and then you go into a massive flare. And the reason for the flare, bring your nose up, is to burn off 100 knots of airspeed because the guys can't jump off at 100 knots. You want to get as close to the tree line as possible. Minimize the amount of exposure these guys have to getting shot. These guys are good. You get within two or three miles an hour of rotating out and they're off, they're gone. You never stop. You're by yourself, there's no gunships. Hopefully, you don't leave a signature that the enemy can say, ah, they just dropped somebody off because it's so quick. You're in and you're out. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve Warzone Tours as an Army Attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear a special combat story of Edward Fugit, also known as Mild Man, who flew Hueys in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia just after the Tet Offensive. This is a special edition for me personally, as longtime listeners have heard me refer to Mild Man and his stories and our similar career paths on several occasions. I wasn't sure I'd be able to do this interview given how close it was to home, but I'm so glad I did. From a very young age, I remember hearing these stories of my dad in the cockpit and vividly remember looking at his silver star and distinguished flying cross on the mantle, wearing his green flight suit when I played army, and then hugging him before I shipped out to my own war as a combat aviator. His experiences in Vietnam will sound like something from Hollywood's We Were Soldiers, where green but determined young aviators flew into hot LZs time and again, risking everything for their ground brethren. We also touch on what it was like flying SOG into combat zones on operations in other countries that nobody would hear about for decades, and what it was like to be at the negotiating table as a diplomat with Kissinger at the height of the Cold War in Moscow. I really hope you enjoy this close to home combat story with a real hero of mine, my dad, that was then edited by his grandson in a true family affair. All right, Dad, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time to sit down with us. Um, people who have listened have heard me talk over and over again about my old man and making some references to some of the stories you and I have talked about, and I'm super excited to actually talk to you on air about it. Okay, great. This could be very interesting. <laughs> Look, so well, I thought about we, ancient history. Yeah. Well, let's start with some ancient history. I guess one of the questions since you were a pilot, I was a pilot, and then Todd or my brother was a pilot. So we kind of have it in the family genes to some extent. Yes. Did you ever think growing up in New Jersey that you'd end up becoming a pilot one day? Yeah, not a bit. Um, it, it jumped, it, it didn't occur to me till I was halfway through college. And I'll, I'll get into that later, how that, that popped up, but it wasn't a plan whatsoever. So growing Given up- my Aviation skills, that's probably the right decision. <laughs> come on. Yeah. And, gr- okay. and growing up in Jersey, what, um, what was it you thought you'd end up doing when you were a kid? And I'm thinking like uh, maybe middle school, early high school. I don't- don't know. The idea was just to go to college. It wasn't, there wasn't a destination beyond college. So that was what my mother pushed. She didn't push to go in the military or anything else. Uh, and of course I had no father, so there was no influence on that side one way or the other. <laughs> and maybe we should talk about that for just a second. We don't have to go into the gory details here, but the fact oh. that you were raised without a father and, right. and I often think about that as I'm raising our boys, like I at least can look at you as an example. Um, but you didn't have the benefit of drawing on that. So you mentioned, obviously, your mom raising you. What was that like growing up without a father? Did you just not know any better? Um, I didn't know any better. Uh, But as I got older, I began to realize, you know, I don't have a set of experiences to draw upon raising you guys. And, you know, it it just wasn't there. My grandfather, I lived in his house. He owned it. But he wasn't a father figure at all. He never went to a single sporting event, never went to the school, but he was, he took care of us physically. That was the deal my mother had with him. And it, it worked out, but he wasn't a figure. I had these three uncles, all who had served in World War II. Um, 
And they I probably learned a lot from them about, you know, the military, and their experiences. Yeah. Um, so that was, you know, there, there wasn't any, any impetus for, for the military at that point. Yeah. Um, growing up, I didn't have an objective. When I got into high school, I began to think, and my senior year in high school, my mother sat me down, you've heard the story. Okay, you're going to college, you got a football scholarship, uh, you're going to study political science. Okay, I just shake my head. <laughs> she never went to college. She barely, she got a GED from high school, I think, on how she knew all this. And she said, this is true. You're going to go and join the foreign service. Uh, okay. So that was embedded in my mind when I was a senior in high school. So I go to college and I do all the political science and international relations studies. And I'm aiming for passing the foreign service exam later on because she told me to. Yes. And it turns out she was absolutely right. That was where my, my strengths were. And it's worth noting, I mean, obviously other people don't know you this well, but I can't even imagine you doing something besides the foreign service. So oh, there's right. something about like, she must have recognized that in you at a very early age as parents can. Right. Um, but like, truly, I can't like you weren't going to be a mathematician or anything else like you were designed for diplomacy. What do you think that was that she saw as you were growing up? Like well, she could have picked anything, was. right? Like law, go be a doctor. But she said, no, go do political science. But what it was was I was only really, really good at history. But I was super at history. Still am, as you yeah. know. Um, so. I think she saw that and said, okay, now where she got the idea of the foreign service, this is a woman in her entire life, never got farther than New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, maybe a hundred miles from New York city. And yet she knew about the foreign service and it wasn't as if my uncles told her, they weren't any more educated than she was. So to this day, I don't know why she came up with it, but she did. She embedded the idea in me. Now she dies two years later when I'm a sophomore in college, but the idea was was in my mind, and and I was really my my skill skill strength is foreign service and it's international relations. It's politics, yeah. which I you know, I'll talk about a little bit talking about Vietnam and everything. But yeah. yeah, and then you mentioned your three uncles. We I mean, we've got a good story with one of them from from uh, World War II. I was just wondering uh, maybe maybe we should share that one early on to to show our lineage here. <laughs> <laughs> the one who got wounded. Yes. Yep. Yeah. He, he was uh, going through OCS at Fort Bragg in 1942. And he was out on weekend leave. And literally, there's a farmer's daughter story. <laughs> and the farmer comes in with a shotgun, chases him out of the house, shoots him in the butt. So he has to go. He's not wounded seriously, other than pride. They have to you know, go to the base and get medical attention. And so he has a hearing and they kick him out of OCS. Very few people failed in OCS in World War II. They had to have everybody on deck. He ended up being an NCO in a prisoner of war camp in Tunisia and then in, in uh, Southern Italy. And and, and a, the, but a specific type of POW camp, right? Like the, one of them was a female POW. There's a picture of him with like two or three hundred German nurses sunbathing behind him. So that's what he did in the war. Uh, all right, yeah. yeah. So that's that's our uh, our World yes, War II okay. history there. But what did what did yes. the other two uncles do? I don't know if we've ever really talked about. Okay, that. one of them was a mechanic on B-29s in. Uh, Taipan, Tinian in the Pacific, towards the end of the war. The other was an officer in uh, engineers, started off in coastal artillery, ended up in engineers in Patton's Third Army. And he went through Europe with Patton's Third Army, never got wounded. Um, I think he ended up as a company commander at the end of the war. He was a captain. Wow. He came back. Yeah. Did you guys used to talk about that when you were at home? I did. He, every now and then we talk about it, but um, it wasn't any attempt. Oh boy, you really got to do this. No, but he stayed in the reserves. Uh, 
After World War II, he stayed in. He got called up and got shipped to Korea. Hmm. And then after Korea, he stayed in the reserves, uh, National Guard, whatever it was, uh, until he got his, his uh, 20 years in. Okay. And then the, just the other family point here to touch on is um, Jim, so your brother. Yeah. And again, like you guys grew up without anybody saying, hey, you need to go into the military. And then you end up going to Vietnam in the Army, and he becomes okay. a Marine. Well, um, he became a Marine because I was in the Army. And he didn't. <laughs> he felt if I went, he had to go. He, to this day, is humiliated that the Marines got out of Vietnam before he had a chance to be shipped over. I said, Jim, hey, you don't need that, really. Yeah. But it bothers him, and he's 75 years old. It bothers him that he didn't get to go to Vietnam. Yeah. Um, okay. No, I... He ended up being an a, a, uh, artillery officer in the Marines, did a uh, deployment cruise, uh, I think, in the Mediterranean. Um, and yeah. then stayed in the Marine Reserve and rose to the rank of full colonel, where he was the commander of the Reserve Recruiting Command for the, all the Marine Corps Yeah, for uh, about three years. So yeah, he had a good career. Um, if we jump then to your time at college, so you're playing football at Vermont, which is a 1A program at the time. They obviously don't have a program anymore. So your full-time yeah. scholarship um, yeah. playing 1A ball, you're doing ROTC, you're getting prepped for political science. What's the, where are we at in the war at that time, if at all? Nothing. You mean in Vietnam at that point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not much. So I could start college in the fall of 61. Vietnam is a back page story. Um, the bigger issue was Laos and Cambodia, to be frank. Um, so you go through, uh, and the ROTC that we learned was focused on fighting the Chinese in Korea. Hmm. It was focused on stopping human wave attacks, seriously. We were taught uh, final defensive fires, machine gun placement, everything else. If you're being attacked in human wave amounts, as happened in Korea. So this was the early 60s, before Vietnam. And that was what the training was, is whatever good training we got in ROTC, which was not much at that time. It's not the kind of program you went through. Uh, the first two years were a total waste of time. Every young man at the University of Vermont by law, had to take two years of ROTC. At the end of your two years, you could quit it. Um, I took two years, and if I had stayed, I said, okay, you're going to be commissioned. We're going to pay you $25 a month as a stipend. That was significant in those days. I didn't have a lot of money coming in. So that's part of my reason for staying in. Um, and the last two years of ROTC was much more intensive and interesting. And this is where aviation pops in. In 63, or six, 63, uh, the Army began in 1962 with the idea of forming an air mobile division. And it was experimental. It was at Fort, I think Fort Benning or Stewart, I'm not sure. Uh, but they had a full division. And they were coming up with a concept of how to use these Hueys and the Chinooks, which they then had, in a new kind of unit which would give air mobility, combat ability. The Army had helicopters at that point, but these were transportation and medevac. They were not combat units. Um, so the, the Army's coming up with this concept of divisions and they're gonna need pilots. They had the Huey. The Huey was designed and built in the late 1950s. So they had the platform around which you can build a division. They needed pilots. So anyway, they sent officers out to different schools and they would give a briefing to the junior and seniors uh, cadets and saying, okay, if you're interested, you can get an a, a, a aviation background. Uh, and we can train you as a pilot. Um, you'll get more money and you only have, listen to this, one year additional duty because your obligation for ROTC was all of two years at this point. And if you signed up for aviation, it was an additional year. That's it. So, okay, fine. I had never thought about this at all. The guy gives the pitch. I raise my hand. Okay. So what, what, like why though? What were you thinking for that? It sounded interesting. <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I had to go do my two years anyway. 
So I figured, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And that led to me ending up in, in the aviation track later on. Um, do you think a lot of the guys I had about six or seven guys in my class who also volunteered and became pilots. Huh. Um, so you mentioned, obviously your mom passes away in college. And right. so you don't really have her as a sounding board for this decision. Right. How yes. do you think she would advise you at your junior senior year? That's a really good question. I think she would have been concerned that this will derail me from going into a good civilian job. Um, but she never, one way or the other, on the military. The only thing I remember her pushing me on is A, earning money, but B, going to college. That, that was the basis of it. Did you talk to anyone else? Did you talk to Jim or your uncles? Anybody? No, I didn't. I just put my hand up. And- Mike Burke? No one. <laughs> Mike hated ROTC. <laughs> no, I said, so I signed, signed the agreement, which committed me to an extra year. Think about it. Now you committed to seven years. Yeah. 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 So it was a different, a different army then. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. And I don't okay. think anybody knew the, at that point, no one knew Vietnam was going to blow up to the degree it did, but the army was planning for it. And that was the air mobile division, which, Starting in 64, they, they made it, it was the first CAV division became the Air Mobile Division. But then the Army develops other units, brigades and battalions of aviation, and they needed people. And then if we, if we talk about you going, coming out of college and then going down that track, I mean, first you go to uh, IOBC, right, as an infantry officer, and first then you I commission. Go, I go to graduate school first. Oh, uh, that's right. Okay. That's right. I go to Let's talk about that. Georgetown. Yeah. Yeah. I go to Georgetown, get my degree in foreign service. Um, and then towards the end of that, I get a letter from the Army saying, okay, young man, you report to Fort Benning uh, on the 15th of March, 1967. Okay, fine. Um, so I accelerate my final exams at Georgetown, take those and go down and check in. And I do infantry officer basic because in those days, the army in its wisdom said, you know, there's no such thing as an aviation uh, career field. Uh, you got to be uh, infantry, armor, artillery, engineers, whatever. It doesn't matter. You get that first. And then as a sub job, you become an aviator, which was dumb. And it took the army 15 more years to change that. Wow. Yeah. It was, I think I think it was around 1980 when the aviation track came in. Up to that point, everybody had to do something else, which meant you couldn't devote your time to you totally devote your time to being a pilot. You had to also be an artillery guy or an infantry guy. And you got promoted in the infantry field, not in the aviation field. This was not a good a good look. And the army finally, you know, and if it's, you know, the slow way the army works its way through these things, they change it long after I left. Um, and, and just for those who aren't pilots and who haven't been in a cockpit and understand what it's like for proficiency, it's crazy to think you could have any other job. Even right. when, when I was in and you are out of a line unit, like you're not in a platoon or a company, you're a staff officer yeah. doing PowerPoint briefings and, and tracking the battle. You're not in the cockpit as often. You are dangerous when you get back in the cockpit because you just aren't as familiar and you don't have time on the sticks. So the fact that you would have a set, this would be like a, an additional duty is frightening. Yeah, it is frightening. And we didn't, we just, you know, like everything else, you accept it. You're, you're yeah. an ROTC cadet, you're a second lieutenant, you don't get a voice anyway. But when I realized, you know, I went through IOBC for six weeks, then goes down to Fort Walters, Texas, for, for uh, basic flight school, which is where you just learn to fly the darn thing. You don't do any tactics. You've got and what are you thing. flying in then, Dad? TH-55s. Okay. Uh, and a little bit of the H-13, which is the, uh, for guys who are t- too young, uh, if you remember seeing MASH, the helicopter yeah, the MASH, bubble. that's the H-13. That was the workhorse of the Army in the 1950s. Did you ever take mom on one of those? Did you get to yes. fly her? When she, um, when at some time at Fort Rucker, uh, I think when I graduated, anyway, she came down with Jim and 
she took a ride in the H. She and Jim and Monica took a ride in the H thirteen, you know, for a lo- on the local airfield, not not an army. <clears throat> With you flying? No, 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 not me flying. Oh, okay. The, the right. guy who's you know at the airfield was doing it, so she okay. did get a uh, trip in one of those. Um, so I wanted to circle back before we come out of your childhood. There's one other element. Okay. So, um, so for those who don't know, my brothers, um, I'm one of four here, and we always talk about how you used to instill in us this, like, you can never quit anything type wow. mentality, right? So I yeah. want to talk about where you got that from growing up, or did that come from Vietnam? No, it came from my mother. You're going to do to college. You're not going to get through it, and you're going to have this career. And this is from a woman who, who never achieved anything. This is what was so remarkable. And yet I bought into it. The idea you keep on pushing on these things, you don't walk away from it. Um, when I get into what happened in Vietnam, that comes, that flashes back when I was really faced with danger. And, and it was expectations, Dad, from her, or was it like, you don't quit? Because we always heard you say, life's not fair, don't quit. So yeah. I'm wondering if you heard that from her, if it was just expectations in mind. Oh, it was, it, she, uh, yes. That was just what she wanted. You're going to do it. Yeah. She never pushed my brother to that degree. And that's a, you know. D- um, different story. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and then you also, it's worth noting, she's from an immigrant family, right? I mean. Second generation. One, second yeah. generation yeah. Irish immigrant, yeah. right? So you still got this immigrant mentality, I would imagine, in the yes. household. Oh, very much. Up. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, uh, we were growing up, you were Irish Catholic. And the Catholic was the operative word, and Irish was secondary. So Protestants were almost the enemy. Uh, all right, all right. That was, that was not unusual in the fifties and sixties. It it went away later on. It's gone now in mean, society, yeah. but it was a big deal at, at a certain point. Right. Okay. So we we fast forward to um, flight school as you're going through um, what. Well, uh, for Walters and yeah. and Rucker, is there anything in your mind saying, "Hey, this is the right choice. This is where I should be," or was it more like maybe that infantry thing would have been better? <laughs> no, I went to infantry school, and okay, that was it. Shouldn't have been as easy as it was because every this was 1967. Every single guy there was going to be a platoon leader as soon as he left uh, in Vietnam. Is what in you're Vietnam, saying. yeah. Period. Now. It isn't like the army where you go to a garrison unit for a while. They needed officers. So uh, I mean, infantry it would have been it would have been an option. I also realized that infantry, you know, you got a chance of being killed there. But by this point, the war was really heating up. Um, so aviation, okay, that buys a year. Um, also, it's it's a it's a different career, it's a different way of having to fight the war. And so I, I go to Walters and you do this, the basic training, learning how to fly. I realized rather quickly, I learned I could hover okay. And that was the criteria for basically continuing in the whole program. Obviously, if you can't hover, you're out. So I was able to hover. Um, I was in, in my classes in flying, I was always oh, just okay. I was never a you know, really great student. Um, but it isn't that hard to fly a helicopter at this point, little things. Um, and once you got past hovering, you get, you know, the pinnacles and all the other stuff came pretty easy. Then you go to Rucker and you start doing big boy stuff. You start using Hueys much bigger than the little things we had before. Um, I could handle that just okay. Then we got into instruments, not good. Uh, whatever it was, I was not able to adapt very well to, to inf- instrument flight flying. The Army didn't bother. You weren't going to get an instrument ticket anyway. They weren't going to waste another two or three months. They needed bodies in Vietnam. But you had to have what was called a tactical instrument certificate, which <laughs> most of us said it's, it's a death sentence <laughs> because you, you got enough training 
to get out of a cloud. Maybe. That's it. Um, we did learn how to do GCA approach. And it's a ground it, controlled approach. So somebody helping to bring approach, you in. Where somebody vectors you into an airfield if everything is socked in. I could not have done a radio control where I had to dial in a frequency and fly a flight plan in the, with a hood on. Yeah. With a hood on, you, you don't see outside the aircraft, and it was very hard. So I got let set back in flight school. Um, I didn't pass the instruments first time. So they set me aside for four weeks. They gave me an instructor pilot, the same guy every day. We worked, we worked, we worked. At the end of that, he passed me. I think I got a gentleman's pass. Again, they were, this was, by the time I was taking that, that was the beginning of the Tet Offensive in Vietnam in 1968. And all hell was breaking loose over there and they needed pilots. My guess was, if you can find out a way to pass this guy, pass him, we need him. Okay. So, um, I did, I did not at that point feel at all confident in my ability to do instruments. Um, but I also heard, you, know, you really, you don't need to do that very much, if at all, in Vietnam. Okay. So, so you, get, um, you get your wings and you get 30 days leave. And every single pilot, every single one went to Vietnam. Nobody went to Germany or Panama. No, no. They needed people. Um, and they were... Uh, pushing, get push more people out. The army in, in early 68 was graduating 1,000 pilots a month. Think about it, guys are listening to this. 1,000 pilots a month. That's, that's warrant officers and commission. Just a huge pipeline of people which they're sending over. When I got to Vietnam, I didn't know this till later. I read some stories on it. When I was there in 68 to 69, there were 16,000 army aviators in country. 16,000. There were 8,000 army helicopters in country. That's a good two to one ratio, that's fine. Um, that was the size of this huge buildup where they taken this concept back in 61, 62, 63 of the Air Mobile and put it on steroids. So you had a division, actually then two divisions, plus you had uh, battalions all over the country. I, and it, the army, you know, the, the country was covered with army aviation. We had all the assets. Why don't you set the context for Vietnam since you're going right in out of there, right? Like what is the feeling, you mentioned the Tet Offensive as you're getting ready to go in. Yeah, this is very important and, and the year this year of 1968, which is when most of my tour takes place, was probably the most, the most tumultuous year in American history, political history. You had the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, assassination of Martin Luther King, resignation of, not resignation, but President Johnson saying he's not going to run for re-election. You had the Chicago riots at the Democratic Convention. Um, and then you had this feeling, this total collapse in confidence in the army. And what happened was 64, 65, 66. Okay. The army was constantly put all things are doing. Okay. There's a little bit of Afghanistan in this, in a way, yep. things are going. Okay. Um, we light at the end of the tunnel, et cetera, et cetera. And people tended to believe the military because world war II and Korea and everything else, they the positive image. Then you had the Tet Offensive, which was in February of 1968. The Tet Offensive was, as it turns out, a military failure by the North and a political victory. Because what happened was they, they stormed Saigon. They stormed a bunch of bases throughout the country. They, they took the city away, which is the second largest city in Vietnam. And we had to go street to street fighting in way. Those were Marines that did that, trying to retake the city uh, and in Saigon as well. So I remember I was just finishing up in flight school and then I had all of 30 days leave and then shipping out of Travis Air Force Base. 
And on television, the, the, uh, the guiding light for America was Walter Cronkite on CBS. And Walter Cronkite turned on the war because of Tet. And the army had been telling them, telling the media, telling the public, things are going okay. And Jesus, we're getting, you know, fighting all over the, in the cities. The embassy was besieged in Saigon, etc. And also at the same time, there was a Marine base up in the North called Quezon, which was close to the DMZ with North Vietnam. And that base was close to being overrun. He predicted, I remember seeing this on TV, probably late February, Quezon is going to fall. It's going to be America's DNB and food. For those who don't remember that, that's the French tried the same thing in 1954, but the French didn't have aviation assets to save their butt. We also did. in Vietnam. In v- yeah. In Vietnam, we had the uh, equipment to keep the, keep the Marines going. In, in case, so Quezon didn't fall. Okay. So I do my months leave, say goodbye, mom, and, and uh, we weren't married yet. Just okay, stop to Chicago and then the ship out. Said, said goodbye to my grandfather. He's still living at home in New Jersey. Uh, so, okay. Dad, what did your uncles think of you shipping out? We've never really talked about They didn't that. say anything. I, you know, they said, okay, they're going to war. They, they had gone to war when they were younger. And they, they just sort of, it, was, it was the way it was. Yeah. So you get to Vietnam, and I'm having just read all the news. And I'm a news junkie, especially in foreign affairs and politics, et cetera. That's and an understatement for people listening. But yes, very true. <laughs> uh, the United States... You know, it felt to me like the United States was losing the war. And I was I'm going over and going into the situation. So I land in, in, in uh, Benoit, which is where everybody flew into. And then you went to a, a replacement depot where they signed you. And you had no idea where you were going to go. And the guy in the replacement depot, okay, we've got 16 pilots. You go there, you go there. And, tell us. and then the next day, somebody picks me up on a Jeep. And they said, okay, you're going to Bearcat. Okay, I don't know. Tell me I was going to the moon. Bearcat's about 60 miles from Saigon. And I'm going to an assault helicopter company. So I think, oh God, this, you know, because I know, remember Bearcat had been hit really hard during Tet. That was only three or four weeks previous. So I get there and this is the important thing. Morale in that unit was sky high. These guys believe they had won the battle with the Viet Cong. The Americans. Felt that. Did. Yeah. We had killed so many, and I heard this over and over from the pilots that were there. They would take uh, the bodies. If the, the, the VC would attack an American base, this is a division size base, which has more machine guns than God, and they got annihilated. It was crazy. I later had some theories on this. We'll get to why that happened. But the unit believed, you know, we had won. We killed all these guys. They had, I heard two guys tell me stories. They had uh, sling loads of bodies to take them out and dump them in the ocean. We're only 20, 30 miles from the South China Sea. Um, so, and this was, it, the ground units I first went to were the same way. So these guys, okay, they had been in a tough fight. Everybody realized it had been a tough fight, but we won not understanding that in the States, it was being portrayed to the opposite. Yeah, you're in a tough fight, but the other guys prevailed and they prevailed politically because right after that, Lyndon Johnson steps down. I'm not gonna run again, which caught everybody by surprise. Uh, And then you had this other sequence of events. But in Vietnam, when I got there, this was not the prevalent opinion of the units. Later on, as my tour progressed and you got more and more troops coming in, replacements coming in, these guys were coming from an environment in the States which was very negative about the military. This is where the concept of baby killers began. Um, The the army was evil. The army had lied to people. That was basically what Cronkite was saying is that it hadn't, Things were much worse than we had portrayed them. And I think that's correct. The army was saying, okay, you got it. And basically we had allies in the South Vietnamese 
that weren't ready to fight. Sound like Afghanistan again. How about so, Laos and Cambodia? What's yeah. the situation there at the time? Okay. Since we're going to Laos get and Cambodia well. are in play at this time. We had a huge, uh, Laos was a CIA operation 100%. And they had, they had paramilitary, they had aviation. And we supported the Royal Lao government. And they were fighting the path at Laos, which was the Communist Party in, in Laos. Then Cambodia was a different situation. Basically, you had a strong president, Nordam Sihanouk, and he was allowing the North Vietnamese to come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and hang a left, basically, into South Vietnam. And you and I were there about four years ago in, in Koo Chi, which is where the tunnels are, the tunnel complex, which you had a chance to go into. That was their objective, move the troops into there for these tunnel complexes, they spread them out around the country. And that was the base from which they launched the Tet Offenses. They had a lot of control in that area. Um, so, so we, well, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, so we, we kind of had the context for, it's actually very interesting because everybody's so disconnected from yeah. a communication standpoint, like we can't even wrap our heads around it today. Yeah. So you've got people as you arrive who are feeling sky high morale, slowly yes. folks trickle in with this like different perspective. Right. Um, you're effectively surrounded by like in the North, you've got uh, the North Vietnamese and you've got Laos and Cambodia on the West. Um, you arrive at the unit. And the other thing I wanted to ask before we get into your first combat experience, there's two things. One is you're assigned to Huey's. Is yeah. everybody assigned to slicks to begin with? Or do some people go straight into loaches? Do some do cobras? How does that work? No, if you got sent to our company, um, I need to explain how it was organized. This is important to understand it because the army changed this later on. The company had 48 pilots. Huge. It had 28 assigned helicopters. you got battalions in the army now that don't have that many people. The company had a major as a commander, and the XO was either a major or a senior captain. The platoon leaders were captains on paper. This is all on paper. Um, and so you had 12 commissioned officers who ran the company, and you had 36 warrants. Okay. The army was, was setting up for this kind of a big unit fight. Um, and I came in and I was, you know, they gave me some scheduling officer duty right at the beginning. And after about two months, you become a co uh, you become a um, platoon leader. But even though you're a platoon leader, you're not in command of an aircraft, you're the, the co-pilot. And basically it's the same as in the army now, I think. The senior aviator, the most experienced person was the pilot in command, whether it was the officer or the enlisted or the uh, warrant officer. And the warrant officers that we had, uh, 36 of them, um, most, uh, let's say 30, had no prior service. They were guys who flunked out of college, they were drafted, said, hey, you know, I got a better deal if you go to aviation, they just stay as a grunt. So they signed up. About five or six of these were prior service. They had been E4s, E5s, E6s, not aviators but they knew the army and they had decided to switch over to the warrant program because it's better money. They were gonna to go to Vietnam anyway. This was a better route for them. Um, and they were the only experienced people we had in the unit uh, other than the, the uh, major commanding it. There was no combat experience in that unit out of 48 pilots. We were all green. So in the world, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So once you've got like three months or so and you didn't kill yourself, you were a pilot in command and you were in the left seat and you're in charge. Um, and then after that, for me, for the officers, you were then to become a platoon leader or an operations officer. Now, we were first lieutenants. I got to point this out too. The army in those days, when you got commissioned, when you went on active duty, you had one year as a second lieutenant. That's it. 
you're then a first lieutenant. You do one year as a first lieutenant, you're then a captain. So your captains had two years experience. You do three as a captain and you don't kill somebody, you're a major. Again, the army had expanded so fast. This is what they had. So you had people in positions, but they didn't have the experience like you think a normal captain. Oh, a captain's a pretty savvy guy. No, our captains weren't. Um, they were learning on the job, but it's just like we were. And so everything that happens, you're doing it with a base of people that are not as well trained as they should be. I suspect the same thing happened in World War II because we went from an army of 110,000 men in 1939 to 11 million in 45. Where did you come up with all the sergeants and the captains there? You appointed somebody, said, son, you're a captain. What percent of the pilots, warrant officers and officers, do you think were younger than 25 or 26 years old in your unit? Almost all of them. Yeah. So yes. very green, as opposed to today where, like when I was a company commander, I had somebody who had been flying for 20 right. years. Right. We had none of that. Um, okay. The company commander, the major, had done one tour previous in Vietnam. He was, he was the experience. We had a, an XO, who I'll get to later, who died tragically. Um, he had a prior tour, didn't help him. Um, so the army is, has expanded. It, it's forcing people into jobs and you gotta learn them. Um, my first day flying combat, I was there three days, you know, you get in, check in, they take you up for an area check ride. And you go up and you fly around, they point out this, this, and this. And we were about four, 50 miles from Saigon. So we flew over close to Saigon. And this is where the backstory, they pointed out the US embassy to me. And they pointed out the presidential palace, which were two, three miles apart in Saigon. Okay, I reversed them in my head. What I thought was the American embassy was actually the presidential palace and vice versa. It had no inf impact then. It did nine months later. Um, it's the, it's okay, you get the your orientation. So the next day they put me up. I'm going with a, a warrant officer, W-1. They were all W-1s. We never had a W-2. I didn't know they existed until they got back to the States because they had the same rule. One year is a W-1 and then you're a W-2. Okay. So this W-1, and we were, uh, it was an extraction for a LERP team that was in, not in Cambodia. This was close to our, at 20, 30 miles from our base. And he didn't brief me at all. And that was the way it was. If you're the new pod, just shut up and pay attention. And, and so, sorry, Dad, you're in a, you're in a Huey with no Huey. guns on it. Yeah, all the, okay. we, yeah, you had, you had door gunners. Yeah, yeah, uh, good point. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Right, always at door gunners. <laughs> yep. Uh, I should say also, we our unit was Charlie models and H models, H model okay. Hueys, which was the most advanced Huey at the time. Um, we had no loaches. That was another operation. We I almost never saw a loach. Um, we just operated as a, an assault company. And the idea the Army had at those point was they combined the guns and lift ships. So one platoon of guns, two platoons of lift. And all the army was configured that way at that point. So you didn't have separate gun company. You did, you might have had a division artillery uh, platoon or something with guns, but I mean, that was the exception. And, and so you're going out to get a LERS team or LERP. LERP. So you're taking me out. Right. Now, when you went to flight school, they only taught you about half of what these helicopters could do. I think the reasoning was we're not going to teach you the whole thing because we're going to lose too many in accidents. Mm -hmm flight school. Yeah. So you get out there and we had done 100% of our approaches and takeoffs in flight school had been a 45 degree approach, 45 degree out. Okay, fine. I understood that. So we get over and we're looking down and, and I don't see anything. He said, we're going down there. And there was a clearing. It wasn't very big. And I said, I didn't want to say anything because you, you realize that you are the lowest form of life at this point. You may be a lieutenant, that doesn't matter. You don't know what's going on. And I didn't, I presumed he did. So we start this 
uh, very slow descent into this uh, landing zone. It's not a big landing zone. You got the, the crew chief and door gunner leaning out the back, giving him, okay, move your tail this way, move that, boom, boom, boom. And I'm just sitting there watching this. I have no idea. I did not know the helicopter could do this, honestly. And I'm thinking, oh my God. So we get to the ground and the, the guys come running out of the wood line and they turn around and they start spraying the wood line. That was my first experience of the John Wayne factor. Um, at the time I thought, oh shit, we're dead. The, the, the VC are coming right behind them. <laughs> no, that meant there was nobody following. Whenever these guys did the John Wayne stuff, everything was clear. It's when they ran full speed and dove in your doors at the helicopter. That's when you knew there was somebody in the wood line. Okay, uh -huh. so I'm sitting there, they come running out, they spray the wood line, they jump on. They go, okay, if he gets shot, I don't, how do I take off? There was no, we had to go straight up. You can't, they never, I did not know the helicopter had the capability. Honest, it didn't. He doesn't. He goes, doo, 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 doo. boom, and then we go back. So I learned, okay, there is there's a lot more to this bird than, than I thought. Um, again, he didn't took me back, said, you, you know, he write a book and that's it. He, there was no instruction. But what I learned was the capabilities. Yeah. I also want to keep my mouth shut. These guys do know what they're doing. Yeah, they're young. They're right out of flight school, but they're flying 100 hours a month. And every single hour they fly is combat. So yeah. they do know what they're doing. Um, May not it, be right. It's similar to my experience. Um, yeah. And I will say just for those who haven't had to go like do a vertical descent and ascent in and out of a confined area, that's what we would call it yeah. where you got trees. Right. Like we did this a lot in Germany. Yeah. It's scary. I, I mean, it's hard to have the spatial awareness of what's going on around the whole aircraft, even if you have other people telling you and it's unnerving and you don't understand the power margins well. And then certainly in Afghanistan, like we were dealing with power margins, I could only imagine where you have like a 1% margin where if you screw that up, the engine's going to die and you got to yeah. be real careful as you bring something in. And you just don't, it's hard to practice that because you'll destroy aircraft. Like people, right. I can't practice it. The only yeah. times we ever did it was real live action. But then you realize what, what it can do, like what it can really do when you're actually in right. those scenarios. Okay. So we go back in. Okay. So that was, that was one experience. And the way our missions were apportioned is very interesting. Um, we basically had three kinds of missions in Vietnam. One, which didn't matter, is called ash and trash. That's where you took mail, you took food out, you took resupplies, et cetera. That was great. Those are days when you're not going to get shot at. Okay. The other two missions were combat assault, which is, you know, 10 ships, four gunships, and you bring uh, infantry troops into a landing zones. Okay. We did that probably three quarters of the time I was in Vietnam. The other quarter was working with special operations and long range reconnaissance patrols, which we'll probably get to this later. They required a totally different set of operations. So we had been taught in flight school how you do combat assaults. And basically in Vietnam, for the formal regular army operations, that's the way you did it. You came in at a 45 degree glide, 10 ships in single file, um, drop your people off, rotated completely, didn't stay on the ground in one second and got out of there and did it over and over and over. And everybody could do that. All the pilots were well-trained in that. Um, and that's what, even though we had this one operation with the LERPs, I go back to my unit and our next operations were uh, combat assaults. And we supported to a lot, we the base we were in was at that time, the base of the 9th Infantry Division. And that had arrived about eight months earlier. So the 9th Division, we supported one unit or another. Uh, we weren't assigned to the 9th. We were a separate aviation battalion and uh, the headquarters, MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, would tell you, okay, today you're going to support this brigade. Now you're going up to Kuchi to support those guys for three days or whatever. So you, you went from one to the other. You never had, this is wrong. We never had any continuity. I don't think we ever supported, other than LERPs and Special Forces, we ever supported the same guys more than two days in a row. You may have had the same thing. 
Yeah, same. Yeah. And so you don't get any um, continuity with a commander. You don't realize, you may, you may see this guy a month later um, because the availability of helicopters was critical to the infantry divisions. And th these, our, our blade time was how they could maximize their ability to carry out their mission. And their mission was to seek and destroy and kill. Maybe that shouldn't have been, that's another story. But that's what the missions yeah. were. And the that battalion commanders, and that's who we'd be assigned to. They'd say, okay, you're gonna work for third brigade and they're assigning you to the second battalion that's located X. The way your operations work in the morning, you get the, the mission the previous night. They come down and say, this is where you're gonna go, third brigade, you're going to their second battalion, here's the coordinates. The commander who was commanding the uh, CNC would leave an hour ahead of everybody else before dawn. And he would head out, he would go down, land and meet with the battalion commander. And they would talk and they would get a, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's, you know, I want to clear this, this and these obstacles today. So then our guys, the rest of the flight would take off and there'd be 10 ships and four gunships. And we almost always made that number. If we didn't, battalion would assign another gunship or another lift ship because their responsibility was to give the ground commander a full aviation company. So it was 15 ships and we generally did it. So you had the mission, um, you went down, you didn't know what you were gonna do, but it was gonna be a combat assault basically, just the, the LZs might be different. So you go in, you meet your, your the CNC ship would meet you. They tell you, okay, go to these coordinates. This is the company you're gonna pick up. So you go in, you land on a road. We often just sat on roads for hours with no barbed wire and no perimeter defense. And we were never, ever attacked. This is, this is interesting. Yeah. Um, it just, you just did, you just sat there. Uh, I've got an infinite number of pictures of our guys sleeping on hammocks underneath the choppers on an open road <laughs> in the Delta. Okay. So you get the mission, you get out there, you, you, you take the troops and you insert them. And normally what the commanders would want to do is insert, make three different insertions. So you'd go to A, pick them up, now drop them off, go pick up somebody else, go to B and C. And the whole purpose of these was to get shot at. They, there wasn't a plan to envelop a village. This, this wasn't that kind of fighting. The plan was to go out in areas where you thought the VC or NVA might be hiding and try and provoke them into attacking you. And then we would bring in the reserves and pile on and try and eliminate them. And the, again, the idea was simply get casualties. The fact that you cleared a tree line, great. You left it, you didn't stay there. It wasn't, again, Afghanistan. You know, you, you might clear one of these little villages, you're gonna leave, and, you know, they're, they're back there. So that's what we were doing. So let's, let's jump to one of the hairier um, assaults since we're talking about the assaults. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, when they think of this, they have this image of the movie, We Were Soldiers, right? I think people my age, yeah. have, yeah. that's probably yeah. what we would say is one of the more realistic, I think, portrayals of flying Hueys into combat in yeah, Vietnam. Yeah. Um, so I know you've got a couple of the, the hairy ones, Dad, which like maybe the Silver Star, DFC, one yeah. of those. Let's talk through one of those. Okay, the hairiest one was, was the Silver Star operation. And that was everything I just described was what started the day. Um, we were, they were in the Delta. Again, it was a battalion of the uh, 9th Infantry Division. They had moved from Bearcat down to Dongtan, which is about 90, 100 miles away. It's right on the Mekong River. Um, and that was a division base camp. So we were often assigned to support them, one of their brigades. And they were assigned, so we went out and met to this company. And I was flying, at this point, I was the lead aircraft. Now the lead is you have 10 lift ships. The senior person is in lift ship number one. 
and he's the flight lead. Above him, flying at 1,500 feet, is the command and control aircraft. And there you have the company commander, the company XO, or the operations officer running the operation. Okay, so that plane had gone in, talked to the infantry brigade and battalion commanders, came up with a concept of operation. And so we put, um, I think we did two ops already that morning, where we put people in, didn't work, came back, put them in somewhere else. And again, what we're hoping for is get somebody to shoot back at us. You know, it sounds like, boy, you, you want to get ambushed? Yes, we do. <laughs> and then we're going to pile on. Okay. So I'm flying ships and we got this uh, LZ, which is, there's a long, a couple of mile long um, canal with trees on both sides, heavily forested, maybe 50, 100 yards on either side of the canal, which was the normal topography in the South. Now, I, I, I should have mentioned, at this point in the war, this is the summer of 68, the Viet Cong had been mostly eliminated as an <clears throat> effective fighting force in third court, in my area, not in the North, they had taken such a whooping in during Tet that what our intelligence was telling us is that most of the units out there are now North Vietnamese units, not Viet Cong. And when you, we, Americans tend to use the phrase interchangeably. They're really not, they're different enemies. Um, so we were going out against a more experienced, v, Viet Cong really were locally recruited soldiers. So, you know, it wasn't sophisticated. The NVA was trained. So now you didn't know if you went into a tree line whether who was gonna be there, but more likely it was NVA. Okay, so we go in and we do the normal approach, right? A school book approach, go down. Um, so we had 10 ships, six guys, which are 60 troops. And we land as close as we can to the tree line without hitting something. The idea being we want to give the ground guys the minimum amount of distance to have to cover from the chopper till they got to the cover of the woods. Okay, so we go down, they jump off. We start to lift off, I'm the lead ship, and suddenly the tree line erupts. Muzzle, uh, muscle fla muzzle flashes all along the tree line, bullets, the holy shit. So we had come to a, not a complete stop, but you slow down with an insertion and then you're picking up, and Huey's, are like driving a pickup truck. I mean, not a pickup truck, dump truck. They're not very responsive. Um, so we're taking off, and we're taking heavy fire. So I'm lead, it's my job to figure out what path to take. The one thing I was good at in aviation was at navigation. I really had a sense of where I was and what I had to do when I, physically. So I said, okay, let's break right because the tree line's to our left. That's where the firing is coming from. Let's break right. And I just called, so everybody pulled, peeled off and got us out of, of the, uh, the fire zone. Okay. So the battalion commander and the company commander are ecstatic because they've got contact. This is a chance for them to kill the enemy. But okay. Now, their being ecstatic means I'm going to be in danger. So we go up and I start pulling out. And this is the first heavy fire we've had in a couple of months. Uh, as I told you, the area was not pacified because that's the wrong word, because we knew the enemy was infiltrating back in again, but they had not initiated contact on their own. The only time was when we forced it on like was happening now. So we're sitting there, I pulled out and we're heading out and I go back and get another load. We were going to put in two loads anyway, this location. So we head back and the CNC ship is up at 1,500 feet on top of this and looking down, and they started shooting at that. So it, it couldn't stay up there. It had to sort of move off. Um, so it could still watch the area, but couldn't be directly over. So I go back, and we pick up. Okay, here's the, the fear factor. Um, when you first get shot at, you're flying. You have to fly the airplane. Forget there isn't any fear at that point. 
you have to control it, you make a right turn, you get out of there. Then once the shooting at you stops, then the fear, oh my God, what am I getting into? And I'm thinking, okay, you know, you have to do it. You're the flight lead. This is your job. I'm serious. This is what's going through my mind. You can't quit. I have my mother telling me that this comes up. And also my football coaches, I'm a lineman in football. You're constantly told you can't quit. You got to keep on going. You got to keep on going. That's in my mind. Now, this is 1968. I finished playing football four years before that. So it wasn't an eternity ago. Um, you realize, okay, you just have to do it. You're in charge. So I pick up the second load of troops and we come back and think, okay, I am not going to do the 45 degree school book approach here. So this is the flat. The Delta is extremely flat. And other than this tree line and a bunch of hooches here, there in the next place, there is not a lot of cover. But what I want to do is minimize the time that we're sitting up in the air where these guys can hit us. So I brief the flight. It's okay. We're going to go back, but we're going to go low level. Stretch out your formation. So instead of being like 20 feet, give yourself about 40. Because we're going to di dip around behind these hooches, try and come up. We had to land south to north. That was just the way the wind was and everything else. So I come around and nobody's shooting us at this point because all the fire is in the wood. But as we get closer to it, I know, okay, this is going to start. And I do know the ground troops are engaged. There's only 60 guys on the ground. I got 60 more. So if you're the platoon leader, you're hoping I get in there because you need some reinforcements. So, and I understand that I have to get these guys on the ground. So I come around and we set up and we start coming in very low, as low as we can go. And I mean, we're flying four feet off the dikes, um, full speed. But then I feel, okay, wait a minute, we can't land at full speed. We can't get 10 ships to flare correctly. So we slow down, we slow down a bit. Uh, you take a chance on, more chance of being shot and less chance on a collision. So I come in, I know where I need to land, just where we landed before. So we, we go down, this is probably 20 minutes from the time I was the first time through there. Go down. And you see the guys that we let off before, they're still right there. They didn't make it to the wood line. They're hiding behind any, anything they can for cover. So I drop off 60 more guys who now realize, oh, they're in it now. This is, this is gonna be a firefight. So then I take off, but I don't go up. I go low and make another right turn. We all do that, we peel out and we take a lot of fire. Once they see us, because to the, to the uh, to the enemy, shooting a helicopter is like winning the lottery. That is a great thing to do, more so than ground troops. So we took a lot of fire. Um, at this point, we had to go get fuel because Huey's two hours max and you got to refuel. Okay, so we had to go back. So everybody had to refuel at the same time. That takes about 30, 35 minutes. But the guys on the ground, there were now 120 ground troops. That's a significant number. The, the division artillery was beginning to hit it. Um, I was talking to the CNC ship and they were trying to get, because this was a, a, a large enemy force based on the fire we were getting, uh, they were getting Air Force assets. This is the only time in Vietnam I worked in an operation where we had uh, fast movers coming in. So I pick up these, the get fuel, go pick up group number three. I do the same evasion coming back. One sec, Dad. Is, is there any discussion in the flight about, hey, maybe we shouldn't go back in there? No, there wasn't. Okay. Um, I think I may have made, guys, we got to do this. They understood it. I mean, yeah. we had done combat ops before, but this one was dangerous. I mean, there was a lot of fire coming. Luckily, nobody, actually people had been hit. We didn't know until we landed. Um, so we come back in again and I'm going south to north and I look up and maybe at a thousand feet coming at me a gazillion miles an hour is an F4. <laughs> and he, his azimuth is it's the same as mine. He's north to south. 
So he's not aiming at me. I'm off to his right. I hope enough. And then he's going to put his ordinance, boom, 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 on the tree line. And he does. Good. Good shot. <laughs> so, you know, he's going four or 500 miles an hour, whatever the heck they launch at. And I'm going at 100 if I'm lucky. <laughs> so we go in, get heavy fire again, go land, drop off another guy. We're beginning to build up significant ground force. Um, we get a couple of hits. Guys take, uh, guys get problem with women, like hydraulics or whatever. So two, two of the 10 aircraft broke off after that, went back to base. Um, we go back and get load number four, repeat this. And they, by this time, they know we're coming in and the azimuth, we only have one choice on the azimuth, the south to north. Um, so they start shooting at us earlier. Um, but we're low. We're, being low gave us a degree of security that if I had come in the normal way, we didn't have. So the, guy, the, the pilots behind me I'm all executed what they had to do. They did it correctly. We kept the gap with each other. We, we landed. Got, so now we had 180, um, yeah, 180 ground troops. You have a full company plus, plus the artillery coming in. Um, there were two more repeats like this. The CNC could no longer do it. I had to do, okay. The early approaches, group two and three, this control ship, CNC, was vectoring me in, saying, okay, go here or there. The CNC, because the fire was so great, they couldn't stay over the LZ. So I had to navigate basically line of sight. Now, I had been in two times, three times. I knew what it looked like. I knew where the hooches were. So I had an idea. Again, here we go. And then just follow me. Got the guys who came around, did the, the, the right turn, came in. So anyway, long story short, we finish up, we get six loads of troops in there. That's a couple of companies. The sad part of these stories, and it always is, I have no idea how the fight ended up. We leave. You know, the, the, the grunts had all their resupply. Um, they were going to go in and go in the woodland. They probably won the battle, I think. Um, so we go back to base. And the next day we fight for somebody else. I never do yeah. know what happened on that assault. Were you uh, evac people out of there? Were they getting uh, hit? Uh, at this point, we weren't. We didn't do okay. any. We could have. Didn't have to. Um, and I didn't know it at the time. My CEO put me in for the Silver Star. He was flying in command and control. And he watched what was happening. And basically, he couldn't control it very well from where he was because of the, the uh, gun target lines, the aircraft coming in, the guys on the ground shooting. And it was my operation, basically became my operation to get these guys in six different times into this LZ. And luckily, we, nobody was shot down. A lot of bullet holes later. Um, there might have been one or two guys whose who's, um, hydraulics got, man, got hit who, early. Whose manhood might have been questioned. <laughs> yeah. But OK. Um, so that that was that was the Silver Star. And I, I really wish I knew what the heck happened. I don't even know the name of the, the number of the unit. Yeah. We didn't write down, we're going we're gonna to fly for so-and-so. We just, yeah. you know, my log book, I'm going to such and such a village. And, you know, that was it's so funny. It. There's just so many similarities to my time in Afghanistan with that. With the exception of the number of ships on that flight, everything else is incredibly similar. Yeah. It's just like... You want to, the enemy wants to take down an aircraft. Um, you got to keep going back in. The first time you go in, it's easier, but then they figure out where you're coming from. They line right. up on you. Um, yeah. Oh man, that's so funny. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk, just go back to maybe that SF, the special ops type mission set. Um, yeah. I know you've yeah. talked to me about some, some really interesting ones. Um, I'd love to, to have you share one of those here, Dad. Okay. Um, we did, okay, we got these missions because we were one of the few and the first H model companies in Vietnam. The H model, for those who understand, is stronger. It's like having an eight V8 instead of a straight score in your engine. So we could carry one or two more people or a lot more if it really got hairy in, in an evacuation situation. 
So we would get an assignment from battalion to send, what we would send is a platoon of lift ships and a section of gunships. So two guns, five lifts. And we would go one or two places, either the SOG, Special Operations Group, which, is, which was a very top secret operation, or LERPs, Long Range Reconnaissance Patrols. The differences are very interesting. The LERPs were regular army. They wore uniforms. They actually took orders from other officers. <laughs> um, they were, you know, and they didn't go into uh, to Cambodia or Laos. They stayed on this side of the border. We knew when we were inserting them that we weren't going to be going across the border. The SOG, au contraire, they went across the border. That was their purpose in life. Um, these guys, I believe, took their orders not from Army. I think their orders came from the CIA station um, because the, the war that they were fighting was getting intelligence on what's coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The regular army, okay, they cared about it, but they, they didn't do it. The special operations people had a disdain <laughs> for the act of duty. <laughs> it was really interesting. Um, I didn't expect that when I got there. They wanted nothing to do with straight leg army. They were, they were quasi espionage. They weren't espionage because they're just intelligence gatherers. Um, so the two op the, the way we conducted the operations, physically flying them, was the same for the LERPs as the SOC. The difference is one is inside Cambodia, the other is inside Vietnam. But you still got shot at about the same uh, proportion of time. Um, I'm going to explain how we did it. This is, interesting. again, in flight school, they never mentioned these operations. Never, ever came up. Probably because people would go, oh, my God. Um, so the first day we went out and did these, uh, I went there and I was sort of a Peter pilot and sort of watching what's going on. And by this point, an SOP had been developed between the SOG. There were several SOGs, one just one platoon. They were all over the place, with four or five of them. But they had an SOP the way they wanted to do insertions. And that had been worked out over time with other Army aviation. This was before the 160th existed. We were the 160th before there was the 160th, if you want. Mm -hmm. So we would go out and they had a plan and how you would do the operation. And the plan was, and this, this would replicate it every time we did it, which is, which is good because you knew exactly what the MO was going to be. So we would go out and they would get their mission. And I'll tell you the bad story about that second. I'll explain this first. They would get a mission. Um, so the, the, the commander, who was usually a major, so the special operations commander, and then the sergeant who was leading the team, usually an E-7. And the teams consisted of three Americans and three Cambodians. Um, so they would have a meeting. The, the major, the sergeant, RC and C pilot, and myself, who was flying the lift ships. The gun, gun pilots would also be there, but it's sort of a secondary. So they would show us on a map, okay, we've been instructed to get intelligence here. They mark an X on the map, okay. We knew exactly where it was. And the MO was we would go up in one ship, one of our ships, obviously. We would fly, we knew where the LZ was gonna be. So we would start 10 miles back. And we would fly up over the LZ for 10 more miles and then turn. So we didn't make any deviation as we were flying up there, nothing to tip off somebody on the ground, either with radar or visual that we were looking to, we didn't circle over that LZ. You had one shot at it. So the CNC ship and myself, we have to visualize where that landing zone is. And it's just a first pass. It's like a recon as you go past straight right. on, and right. then you're going to come back. Okay. Right. And then you go back to base. So we'd fly over. We all said, yeah, we know where it is. We marked, make sure we're both on the same map. Usually we did the actual insertion the next morning. And we did it. Uh, it was really interesting. The CNC ship, again, would go up to altitude. 
fly almost the same route north of whatever distance. And as the lift ship, I would go out and suddenly drop off the map. I would uh, do one of these uh, accelerating uh, spirals to get to the ground and get on a, an azimuth. So we, we would be instructed, uh, I would come down and I knew basically head this direction. So then the CNC ship is up there. I'm going as fast as I can. He's going relatively slow. He wants to keep me in sight. And our chopper blades, I don't know if you guys still do it. One of our blades was white on top. The other was, was dark. So you could easily see the rotor disc when it was spinning. Not a bad idea. Whoever thought of it, you know, yeah. um, a good one. Okay. So he would can watch us and say, okay, now you, you go left, uh, 10 miles, four miles, whatever it is. Um, he would try and bring us over um, the, lead, the lip of the LZ. He's going to half a mile, a quarter of a mile. But once you reach the edge of the LZ, you might be 200 feet in the air because these are double canopy jungles. So you drop down and then you go into a massive flare. And the reason for the flare, bring your nose up, is to burn off 100 knots of airspeed because the guys can't jump off at 100 knots. You've got to go down and you want to do two things. You want to get as close to the tree line as possible. Again, minimize the amount of exposure these guys have to getting shot. So you come down, uh, you initiate your flare, you come down, put your nose down, and these guys are good. You get within two or three miles an hour of rotating out and they're off, they're gone. You never stop. You just sort of roll down and your nose and then you go out and you look for an exit point in the LZ. You're by yourself. There's no gunships. There's gunships a couple of miles away. But they're not going to help you. Um, it's just you. You go out. You, you look for an exit point from the LZ. And then you continue on low level. And then you get back to altitude. Hopefully, you don't leave a signature that the enemy can say, ah, they just dropped somebody off. Because it's so quick. You're in and you're out. Uh, and usually it works. Most of the insertions did not lead to contact, the insertions. Extractions are a different story. So you go back and for the next 30 minutes, you'd circle. Uh, make sure the guys on the ground were, were okay. Their instructions, their, their orders were, if they were compromised, in other words, they land, they look around, they don't move very far. They move, just get behind a tree. And they want to see if there's any evidence that the VC and NVA had seen them come in. If they don't have any evidence of that, then it's a go on the mission. So it takes them about 30 minutes to make sure they haven't been spied on. Uh, and then they, they call us. And one of these events of, of slight digression, where we're circling around, we almost get hit by a B-52 strike. We're circling, and I hear this whoosh come by. Like, like when you're in a subway and a train comes through, that's what it was. And then I look down, and the ground, I'm at 1,500 feet. The ground to my left is erupting, two, 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 two. The B-52s always drop in a, a, a two, 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 two formation. So I said, oh, Christ. So I'm turning. Oh, wait a minute. Just turn the other way. Um, and what happened was we found out later because uh, we always monitor guard and Saigon would say, okay, arc light, whatever the code for it, certain location at this time. Um, well, they had given it to us for two hours later. They goofed. They misread Greenwich Mean Time, whether Saigon did it or the pilots or what. But anyway, so we just about, you know, got blown. There, there were no pieces remaining if you been hit by that. Okay. So we circle around, we go back to base. And then you sit there for a day, two days, max three. Their orders were to stay three days. Their orders were not to contact, not to make any contact with you. You're not, you're not there to get in a firefight. You're there to count, you visualize. How many people are coming down? How many trucks? What's on the trucks? Um, so whatever information they got, and they would not, you know, they, they didn't use their radios unless it was, Something happened. Um, so we would just sit there. We're sitting in the, in the, in the talk with the, the uh, special operations major who's running the operator, just waiting. 
and either they would get compromised or they thought they were compromised or they'd done the three days. Um, so then they would start moving back towards landing zones and they sort of had an idea and they may have covered two or three miles from where they landed because we couldn't put them in close to the Ho Chi Minh Trail. There were, there were thousands of NVA in these areas. So we were a distance away, we hoped. So they had them walk in, get their sightings, get their intel, then walk back. And again, we couldn't extract them from an LZ close to the Ho Chi Minh trails. Or just We'd be slaughtered, wouldn't work. Um, and these guys were good and they would go in, they would set it up and they would come back. Um, one day we had, it It was too bad. One of the Cambos was putting in a claymore and the detonator was on his chest here and he bent over and blew his top half of his body. So that compromised the mission. They throw the, threw the remains in a body bag and they started moving out and you know, we extracted them. Um, so the, the guys would then head back. And this was always the interesting point for us in the extraction. If they were being followed and they believed they were, they would tell you that. They weren't going to, you know, they, they, we're going to try and get to an LZ. The CNC ship would get up there. They would use panels. They're going to a clearing and use a panel, green, purple, whatever. CNC would say, okay, fine. Go 400 yards, go, go a mile and a half of this aspect. Um, and we can try and pick you up. There's a big, good enough landing zone. So they would minimize the radio conversation. So then I would go out. Uh, once the CNC had an idea where he was putting him in, I would go out and do repeat what I did when the insertion. I would go low level, and he would vector me in. You can't navigate a treetop level in double canopy. It's impossible. You have to have somebody telling you. So he would vector us in. We would get to the edge, again, um, of the tree line, where by this point, he believed that the team was on there. He, he wouldn't send us in until what? He, you know, he always knew that they were there or not. So we would go in, and this time we had to stop because people had to get on. So again, we would do the huge flare, put it down as close to the tree line as possible. They would come running out, and we knew if they were in trouble, they would dive. And we had a lot of instances where guys would just dive in. They weren't John Wayne. They were getting the hell out of the dodge. So uh, we would come in. We'd have to stop, which is unfortunate, but there's no other way. You had to you know, stop. They got on, and then you take off. Again, Huey, especially with a full load, doesn't accelerate well. And you had to get enough acceleration to clear the trees at the other end of the LZ. And this left you open because you're in this LZ for another 40, 50 seconds. If somebody is coming up, you are a sitting duck. You're going 10, 20 miles an hour, trying to climb. You had to climb, you had no choice. Um, and you were exposed. Sometimes you get shot at, sometimes you didn't. The event, I want to highlight, we have one uh, particularly bad of it. It's in May of 68. And the ground command, the, um, the unit, the, the, the patrol was surrounded. The VC had chased them. We tried to come in. We, a ship was shot up badly. Guys were killed. Um, the commander on the ground was a Sergeant Benavides. You want to Google him? He's got the Medal of Honor for this. Um, so he was the ground commander, and he pulled his people in to a tight defensive position, hoping we'd be able to get another aircraft in to rescue him. And he put up a stiff resistance, kept the NVA, uh, yeah, because this would be NVA along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, it wouldn't be Viet Cong, kept them at a distance. Um, and then we were able to get another ship, went in, landed, got everybody. Some guys got wounded and we got them out. I wasn't on that operation, but he, he got the Medal of Honor for it. His name has been mentioned frequently when they talk about renaming army bases, Fort Hood in Texas, because he's a, 
He's a Hispanic and he's from Texas. So it could very well be it. ended up getting that. He died, unfortunately, about 20 years ago. Um, I met him a couple of times later. Pretty good. Anyway, so you get these you know, circuits. Sometimes these guys do get cut off. Um, and then you've got to come in. One of the, I've read two or three books on the Saab. And one point they make in the books, 100% of these guys were wounded or killed. Their tour, you know, just what you were doing. Um, it was dangerous. Another story, this is a real world stuff. So we get the mission that comes down from Saigon. We're sitting around and this was the second time we had been told we had to strip our aircraft. We, the pilots, take off your dog tanks, uh, take off your U.S. Army nomenclature, paint over. I've got a picture. You've seen it. Paint over the U.S. US Army on the side of the, the helicopter. Um, so you're going in, you know, I don't know what you were meant to be. Well, yeah, what, what, I often think of that. Like, what, what else would you be? I mean, I, I understand yeah. why you want to be kind of covert, but if you're shot down there, it's not like they're going to think you're Norwegian. No, right? I was, yeah, what are we going to be, Australian tourists? Right. To Rented a helicopter? <laughs> this is stupid. And also, here's the problem. I remember our guy said, look, these guys, I just took international law courses. This is bad. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Okay, but we did it. There were yeah. orders. Yeah. Okay, so we put in one insertion, and these guys got shot up pretty badly almost as soon as we put it down. The area was teeming. Oh, part of the mission was to capture an NVA truck and drive it out and bring a Chinook in and Chinook it out. Okay, this is James Bond shit. Sorry. <laughs> Um, you had to find a truck, make sure it still had its ignition. I don't know. Uh, and then somebody has to drive it with 8,000 NVA within five miles of this place. Okay. <laughs> so the first operation was a failure. So the order came back again from Saigon, whoever ordered it to do it again. So I'm sitting there. I'm just a dumbass first lieutenant. Um, this didn't strike me as a great idea. The sergeant who commanded the insertion had argued against it and argued against it. And then, you know, the, the commander, you're going to do it. So the sergeant takes off his beret, throws it on the table, F you, sir. This Whoa. is a green beret, right? So th it's that's a green a beret. beret. Yeah. Right. Because it's not going to undertake a suicide mission. Okay. So the commander, you know, because he's under pressure from Saigon to get this damn thing done. Well, this is a pipe dream. You're not going to get out of Trump, but okay. So they get another guy to do it. So the other guy has the meeting. After the meeting, he takes me aside. And he says, Lieutenant, we're going to be compromised within 10 minutes of going on the ground. <laughs> because as the insertion commander, it's his prerogative under the rules of engagement. If you believe you've been compromised to pull out immediately. It's your call. There's nobody who, who can, it's not like to have today satellites. Oh yeah, we saw, there was no one there. Okay. He could do it. He said, don't go far away. So we insert him. I go, I go circling about two miles away within five minutes, whatever the call sign was, you know, we got, got contact going back to the LZ, pick them up and go out. They <laughs> dropped that mission. Okay. Um, you can see why, you know, they would do it politically. They wanted to try and prove to Sihanouk, the head of Cambodia, that these guys were coming through his country. They were coming through by the tens of thousands, literally. I mean, it, it, the NVA infiltration was just incredible. The stories about the Ho Chi Minh Trail, amazing. So I've, um, just for people listening, um, if you're interested in this SOG background, I interviewed John Stryker Mayer, who was on it. Uh, on a SOG team. And he talks about all of this, like what his book is across the fence, how they describe kind of going into these places. Yeah. Um, small teams. In fact, when he first lands at his first base as a SOG team leader, or, you know, like he's starting to get integrated into a team, 
Like he literally watches another team leave and they never come back. Like they get yes. decimated on the objective. Yeah. Yeah. So like that's his introduction to this year that he has ahead of him. So it's really, it's an incredible story, these guys that they go through. So. No, it is. It's absolutely true. And it's remarkable. And they kept on going back in and in. And I was actually encouraged by the, the sergeant who said, screw you, basically, because he recognized that this was not a winning proposition. It's not as if you, you know, you're going to give yourself up for the good of the country because you're not going to bring anything back. You're going to be dead. So, yeah, yeah that, that's just the way it had to work. Um, well, so we had a lot of close calls on these operas. I never, um, everything seemed to work out for the ones we did. And I think that's a testimony to the tactics that have been worked out prior to us. I mean, between the SOG and the Army aviators. And they made this up out of whole cloth. There wasn't an SOP for any of this. Yeah. And they came up, okay, this is the way we're going to do it. And as I reviewed the steps that I was taking to do an insertion, that's about as safe as you can make a very unsafe activity. Yeah. Yeah. Hell, I mean, getting vectored into an LZ you've never seen for the exfil yeah. and somebody else telling you, get ready to flare. <laughs> I mean, that's Trust me on this. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So let's talk, let's go from you were lucky in that case to one of the, the unlucky times where you make the front of the New York times. Yeah. There's two stories we're going to throw in here. And one thing you never want to happen with your unit in combat is to be on the front page of the New York times. You almost never in any job, like no, at the agency, job. the state department, the military, you right. really don't want to be on we, the front. We page. had two incidents in the same summer to get us on the front page. The first one, was probably the biggest mid-air collision in the history of the U.S. Army. And this happened. Um, we had the Thais, Thai Army, took over from the 9th Division, garrisoning the base of Bearcat. Okay. So they had run there. They had a full brigade there. And we were going to give them training in how to do air mobile ops. In the entire time in Vietnam, we never... Uh, did a training exercise except that one day. Everything else we did was real world. Okay, so we set up and it was 10 ships. Uh, we didn't use any gunships. We had 10 and we had a command and control ship. And the command and control ship was uh, commanded by the XO of the unit, who was a second tour officer and a very experienced pilot. So he gets up. We pick up the, 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 the ties come to us and we're at the same base. They just walk over and get on the choppers. We had 10 ships. We go up and there was a, a fog cover, not a fog cover, cloud cover, sorry. So we're at 1,500 feet. The crowd, about 1,200 feet. They're not very far, but they're, so they're covering it. So he says, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go through the clouds and mark the LZ with a smoke grenade, which is what we did um, in all, most operations. Okay. So we're circling up above. I'm in ship number three. There's 10 ships. And one of the ironies of this story is the guy who was flying as co-pilot in the CNC was a good friend of mine from the union. He's a warrant officer, uh, but he had played two years of football at North Carolina State. So we had that in common. We'd become pretty good friends. And he was the only guy that I saw on my tour who believed he was going to die in Vietnam. Everybody else said they ain't going to make it. Um, so some, somebody gets sick. Long story short, I put him up to be the co-pilot like at 1030 the night before. So, okay, you're going to be co-pilot in the CNC ship. Okay, fine. Um, so we take off. He's the co-pilot. The CNC ship pops through the clouds, marks it. Then he calls to us, okay, mark the LZ, come on down. So we're in single file and we didn't practice flying through clouds very much, but the cloud was, we probably figured 20, 30 seconds and you pop out underneath. So we start in a left-hand descending turn and I'm the third ship, I'm not in charge of this. Um, we get about 10 seconds into the cloud and I see 
Now, cloud is dark inside. I see a huge fireball in front of me. And it's, oh my God, just suddenly it, it comes up. My first thought was we'd been hit by an artillery shell. We'd somehow gotten in a gun target line and screwed up and shouldn't be here. That was, that was, that was initial thought. So I'm still in the left turn within a second or so, maybe two seconds. And this all happens. Another flash. Holy. So I pull controls to the right, pull in, my, I, I overmax the engine. The red warning light goes on. I don't care. I needed all the power I could get. So, because we're descending to the left and the fireballs are right in front of me and to my left. So I'm descending into them. I've got to get to the right. So I pull out and at that instant, now this is maybe three seconds into this, I see the tail boom of one of the, I think it's a number two aircraft. I don't know, but it was definitely a tail boom pass a foot below my rotor disc. So I had pulled out right and my rotor disc is going like this and his tail boom comes right underneath. Didn't hit me. Okay. Had it hit me with another aircraft. So I pull out and everybody, there's no control at this point. She's very screaming. Um, I pull to the right and come out and pop, go up and pop out. And the other guys behind me pop out. Nobody knows obviously what happened at this point. This is still within 10 seconds of the initial impact. Um, so we circle, we, we sort of form up and we look around and we still don't know who's missing. It's pretty hard to do an inventory check at altitude. <laughs> so anyway, one of the, somebody says, it wasn't me, should have been me. But anyway, let's go back to base. Base camp's only 10 minutes away. So we fly back, land. And what happened was, fast forward to the after action report, accident report, they came out. And the decision was that what had happened was the command and control aircraft after marking the LZ was climbing back up into the clouds. Okay, the sky is huge. He climbed exact, because he couldn't see our planes coming down through the clouds. So it's like a bowling ball hitting the number one pin in the pocket and number one pin hitting number two pin. So you had this crash, everything came together in explosions. Had, when we were circling that four or five minutes while we're trying to figure out where the heck, what's going on, we could look down to our left and there was a smoldering pile of wreckage. One pile. All three of the aircraft conflagrated together and impacted in one place. How close were you guys in uh, distance, Dad, when you guys were flying through those? Clouds? 20 feet. 20 feet. That's amazing. We were, we were awful close. We don't usually do it, but you're in the cloud and you had to make sure that you didn't lose sight of the rear light of the guy in front of you. That was your only bearing at that point. So you stayed at about 20 feet. Um, so luckily it was a descending turn and you know that may have helped my rotor blade get you know get over whatever it was. When they policed up the remains, and years later I ran into a guy who was in the MP unit that policed up the remains. When I retired, ran into this guy by chance. He said, Oh my God, what is Carnal House? Okay, one body wasn't in the pile. One of the crew chiefs, right? No one knows if he meant to jump or he was ejected, um, but everybody else was found in one clump. So we had six pilots killed, six crew members killed, and about 25 ties, including a couple of colonels. This was a disaster, obviously. Um, you know, and it was the only non-operational amazing training uh, operation we, we had. So that, of course, made it to the front page of the New York Times. 
The other event uh, didn't happen to me. It happened to a good friend of mine. I'm still friends with him today. You've met him, Steve Krug. Mm -hmm. Um, he was flying for a battalion in the 9th Infantry Division down on the Delta, right on the Mekong River, um, near the main bridge that connected the central part of Vietnam with it. There was only one bridge over the Mekong at this point, and the VC had blown it about a month before this. So we were in there, the engineers were in there trying to rebuild this bridge. All right. So... He was the CNC that day for a battalion. And they were trying to clear an area on the southern side of the Mekong. Um, so he had put, put troops in. The point of the story is the battalion commander was the son-in-law of General Westmoreland. This happened two months after Westmoreland relinquished command in Vietnam. He was brought back to the States. Um, but this guy was still obviously Westmoreland's son-in-law. Westmoreland was at this time the chief of staff of the army. So the way the event occurred, um, we put some troops in a, a distance away from the river. And our birds had to go back to refuel. I wasn't in this flight. So the birds had to go back to refuel. So the ground commander, who's a full colonel, I'm sorry, a lieutenant colonel. And we had these problems all the time because in theory, in aviation, as you know, the air mission commander controls the attitude and how the aircraft are used. The ground commander tells you where he wants to put them in. But there's supposed to be a commonality here. But what you had was, because we were all junior, this first lieutenant was supposed to be a major. On paper, that would be a major's position. It's a first lieutenant with five months active duty, five months combat experience. So the battalion commander basically browbeats him. And what he wanted was for us to take up our chopper. And he was in it. He and his, ex, his, his, his XO and another guy, radio operator, and fly over the, called, we call it Nipapam, along all the rivers of Vietnam, these very dense, 100 yard wide um, forests of, it's not trees, these are palms, but it's extremely thick and it's a great place for the NVA and VC to hide out. That's, unless you're flying right on top and looking down, you can't see what's in there. And he wanted to do it. Well, that sounds like a great idea, except your chances of getting killed. One of the rules we had is you never fly below 1,500 feet unless you're right on the deck. And to be at that altitude and over the nipple was asking for it. Because if it worked and your rotor wash pushed the palms away, you saw somebody, they also saw you. And they definitely had a gun. This is what happened. So he kicks up, hovers, sees somebody, the guy opens fire. And Steve, who's an excellent pilot, takes the ship, he's at probably 30 feet above the ground, above the water at this point, and pulls out over the water, trying to get away from the fire. Again, all this happens in the space of two or three, maybe four seconds. The fire he took, knocked out his engines and he crashed maybe 30 or 40 yards from shore. And so it's he and the co-pilot are obviously in the front. And then these uh, crew chief and door gunner and three guys, a battalion commander and two other people in the back. We do not know what happened to them. The ship hits the water and immediately sinks and it goes down. Steve is was not harmed at this point, is able, it starts going down. The Mekong River, A, is, as you've seen, is extremely fast and deep as can be. This is a Mississippi sized river with the amount of water flowing through. So the ship is going, the chopper is going down. 
he kicks out the light, uh, the um, glass above him. Um, and he's able to get out and he helps his co-pilot. Now, the, the fact that they got out is amazing because they had chicken plates on them, which prohibits any ease of movement out of the aircraft. Chicken plates are kind of like augmented armor that you put on yeah, around your the, seat. Right, right next to the seat. Plus he had a chicken plate on him. Anyway, he pops it out, he gets out, gets his co-pilot. And he said, as he told me the story, he said, I didn't know up from down because the chopper had inverted. You're in the water. And I've heard this before. Um, the people, you know, you, you don't know which, which way to go. He looked at his bubbles, saw the bubbles and said, okay, that's up. So he goes to the surface and he surfaces and the co-pilot is near him and wounded. So he grabs Fernan, the co-pilot, and from the bank, they start shooting at him. Oh, Christ. So he says, I got to go back under, grab a breath, go under, stay under, pop up, go to. Now, what worked in his favor is the current, as you saw, is extremely fast. And it's pushing him downstream, away from the fire. So he gets pushed maybe another two or three, four minutes. I don't know. He's able to keep the other guy afloat. And then firing stops. So he figures he's past this guy. So he starts heading into shore because he has to get out of the water. This guy's going to die. And he's, you know, he, he may be paddling right up to another NVA unit, for God's sakes. So he pulls in. He hides in the NIPA there. Our unit refuels, comes back, and they, the gunships start searching along the riverbank, and they find them, go in, pick them up, and get them out. Okay. So, you know, that's the story. He gets us. Silver Star for this. Now, what we don't know is no one else on that plane escaped alive. There, and there's no doors. The, the ease of exit from the back of the Huey is pretty good. Yet neither the crew chief, door gunner, who are used to jumping out of these birds, or the uh, battalion commander, etc., got out alive. Um, I'm sure, now they, the army sent in huge cranes and they lifted the ship out, and they, I'm sure they did an after-action report. But they weren't really caring about anybody else. They were caring about Westmoreland, Southern. Westmoreland, yeah. Um, you know. So, it, yeah. I was going to say it's interesting because when we went through flight school, when we go through emergency procedures, we have one for going into the water. And it's right. probably because of these events where yeah. you're told, wait until the aircraft turns over or the blade stops spinning, because what you don't want to do is pop out and go straight into a rotating blade. And then yeah. you got to figure out which way is up, use your bubbles. <laughs> um, so what I, I remember, as you told me that about Steve thinking, I wonder if the reason I have this is because Steve <laughs> went into the water that day and that became an emergency <laughs> procedure later on for us. Right. So here's a subset of the story. It's rather interesting. 40 years later, a guy named Chuck Hagel. Chuck Hagel was Secretary of Defense in the Bush administration. He was a senator from Nebraska. Chuck Hagel was an enlisted man in the Vietnam War. And I didn't know this until his book came out. And I read it, was reading his book. And he was assigned to a battalion of the 9th Infantry Division. He was there the same time I was in Bearcat and then Dongtown. Okay. The day of the shoot down, um, he was on the ground uh, in the Nippa, close to the edge there, because we had put troops in that area. No, no, not Hagel, his brother. They both were in the same unit. He got permission to both be in the same unit. Hagel was back taking an NCO test. So the brother was there. And the brother tells this story. I think, I think I showed it to you. But the brother says, suddenly they shot the plane out, and I could see this uh, enemy through the Nippa about 30, 40 yards away. He said, I grab my M16 and I just go rushing there. I break into the clearing. This sounds like a James Bond shoot him up. He spins and I grease him. He just, you know, uh, he had the drop on the guy and killed him. So we had all thought that basically Steve survived because the current pushed him <laughs> down the river. Maybe he survived because this Hegel kills the guy. Anyway, that's it's a... Yeah. 
But you know, it, the book was never referenced us in it at all. It just, you know, this plane crash. He didn't know who the plane was, like everybody else. I think I have the book. It's Our Year of War. Yeah. I think it's called Our Year of War. Actually, it's a pretty good book from yeah, a grunt's a point book. of view. Yeah. yeah. No superhuman stuff, just here's what it was. So anyway, that also made, obviously, the front page of the New York Times, tragically. And then just before we, we kind of leave the Vietnam story, because there are a few other things I want to talk about, um, I, I want us to spend just a bit of time on the DFC experience. Yeah. Uh, what happened? I was flying command and control that day in the Delta. We had worked with the 9th Division. The lift ships had already gone back to Bearcat. We dropped the commander off. We were starting to head back. And we get a call from our ops saying, look, there's an emergency mission. We need two helicopters. Can you do it? And I said, what, what is it? And they said, well, there's a company that's surrounded in the Plain of Reeds. The Plain of Reeds is located from Saigon to the Cambodian border. It's flat as a billiard table. There are no trees. Um, so we would never really operated. I'd flown in there once or twice. and I was sort of familiar with it, but not terribly so. So we said, okay. So I had, took another guy. Um, and it might have been Jeff Coop, actually. I'm not sure who was my, the other pilot. So we go out and they tell us, okay, fly to this battalion base camp. And they'll give you, the, they need resupply, ammo food and you got to go there and take dead and wounded out oops not never a fun mission so we go to battalion guy tells okay shows the map here's where they are so, nice. okay it is an area that is absolutely pitch black there are no towns from saigon until Phnom Penh, cambodia 400 miles to the east it's just it's just flat terrain so it's after dark and we have done unlike you guys almost no night flying. We can go cross country at night. I could have made it home, but we almost never did night combat ops. We didn't have the equipment for it or the training for it, but we had to, this guy, these guys were surrounded and they needed resupply. So we go up and I talk on the radio to the other plane. I say, okay, uh, looking at the map and get up to altitude. I realized what we can do is the canals all through this area is honeycombed with linearly straight canals cut for sugar farming, I think, but I'm not sure what it was. But in the sunlight, in the sunlight, in the moonlight, they're, they're almost like highways. You can use them. So I saw on the map where he was, where the company was located from a junction of a couple of canals, a sort of an azimuth of X. Okay. So I told the other guy, I'm going to go down first. You stay up 1,500. I'm going to drop down on the right-hand side of this canal. And then I'm going to go over until I'm alongside that canal. Then I'm going to follow it until it junctions with this other canal. From that, I pick up a heading of 270. And I figure I'm about three miles or two miles out. And once I hit that junction, that will take me three or four minutes. You come down and do the same thing. So I follow the, this canal, get to the junction, cross the junction, pick up the azimuth I want. And I can, I can do that kind of uh, in, instrument work and stay on a certain heading. That's not, not too bad. Um, so I go along. I get in touch with the ground guy. I said, OK, I'm coming in. I'm about three miles out. When I get close, I want you to give me a strobe light. And I said, when I do get over you, I'm going to have to put my landing light on. I've got to see where I'm touching down. So we go along and I got to figure how far I am from the strobe. It's, it's really hard at night with one light to get distance from one light. A couple of lights you triangulate, one light's harder. So anyway, coming down, I do see his light. So I know where I have to go. So I'm going along. Now, the enemy is in the area underneath me, but it's pitch black. They can't see me. And rotor blades have a way of spreading noise out. So the guy on the ground can't see exactly where you are. So, and, you know, you fly over somebody so fast, 100 miles an hour. Again, I'm flying 15 feet off the ground. I can do it because I know there are no power lines, no trees, 
no hills. This is, thank God, it's flat. If this were the northern part, second no core, chance. I could it'd be a different situation. Okay, so I go in, I see the light. Think, okay, again, I do my great big flare because uh, I'm going to burn off all that speed, which I had a lot. Put my nose down. Then I tell the co-pilot, I said, okay, I'm going to have you turn on the landing light for maybe two seconds. That's all I need to gauge where the ground is. But I have to have that because I don't know what they've got around me or anything else. Um, so he flicks it on. Ah, everything was there. I was close to the LZ. Uh, he flicks it off. I go down and put it on. Now I have to sit there because they've got to offload ammo, food, and whatever, and unload dead and wounded. Okay. Um, I know, how, okay, how do I get out of this place? I know I can't go behind me because the other guy's coming in on the same asthma. So I'm going to figure, I've got to take it to a 20 foot hover at least, because I'm not sure what might be in front of me. There might be a radio uh, wire uh, or whatever. So I bring it to about a 20 foot hover, put the nose over. And again, acceleration in a UE is a misnomer. <laughs> and we putt putt along. We, we clear the burn. This is a pretty small defensive perimeter, but we clear it. And then I just keep on going. It doesn't make what difference, any difference, which as I take, there could be enemy in anywhere. So I go for about two or three miles. Then I, I climb up. Meantime, number two plane repeats the same thing, comes in and gets out. Again, we never got shot at. Oh, we did get shot at on the ground in terms of rounds coming in, but they weren't accurate. So nobody got hit. We get out, get back up to altitude. We're running low on fuel. We head back to the uh, division uh, hospital, land, and we were able to get somebody to come out and take the, take the dead and wounded off. Um, total time from uh, mission to finish, two and a half, three hours. Um, and the, what made it possible is just I could navigate my head. Yeah. yeah. If I had to do IFR, I wouldn't be able to do it. But the navigation part, I could do. No. And I, know, I mean, you're... You always like to joke self-deprecating about your flying skills, but like that and the midair and getting out of those. I mean, and yeah. I've been at some of your reunions where the guys tell me <laughs> you're, you're a good pilot. So, well, I had one crash and the co-pilot saved me. You heard the story. Yep. Uh, this is an aviation show, but uh, I was pulling, coming in. We had troops in combat. I was trying to land and get some flares, uh, came to a 30 foot hover, started to hover down and suddenly the aircraft started to twist and I made exactly the wrong decision. I thought it was a gust of wind. So I pulled in the power, au contraire. We had a tail order failure. The more power, the quicker you're gonna spin, idiot. So after about, again, three or four seconds, my co-pilot says, give it to me. He said, you got it, which is the way you train it off. He got it, he, cr he cuts power. We, we do a controlled crash, but we stay level. And the secret in any hovering auto rotation is to stay level. He kept us level. He walked away from it. So then we got out, opened up the uh, crankshaft in the rear, and there you could see this, the, uh, the, uh, the rotor just snapped, the control shaft. So, okay. And that, that guy was Jeff. Me, yeah. Had it been me, I would still be spinning until no. I ran out of fuel. <laughs> but that anyway, was Jeff yeah. Coop. And that now just, I have a brother named Jeff after yeah. that guy. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So I wanted to jump. If I know we can't spend a ton of time on the, on the state department part of your career, which is where you spend the majority of your career, right? Like oh, yeah. you come out of the military, you still do a reserve career in the military, but right. your focus is the state department. Yeah. And I don't know what the equivalent is. But if we talk about some of these really memorable times from Vietnam and you try to figure out like one or two of those from your time in the State Department, I wonder if it's like meeting with Kissinger or what it was, a meeting you were in, some type of negotiation. What comes to mind for you there? Okay, two events, okay, is when Kissinger, and I was a junior officer, I was the equivalent of a junior major at this point in the Foreign Service. But I was the desk officer for a country called Angola, which was then on the front page of every paper in the world. Kissinger wanted to take it to the Russians. I was the expert. I had been in Angola. 
Uh, I've been through the, what, what everything that happened there. So he takes me to Moscow. Long story short, we go into the meeting with Gromyko. Gromyko is the Russian foreign minister at this point, had been for years. And he and Kissinger met twice a year to talk over the world. Okay, so Kissinger, I'm the junior guy in this whole room. Everybody else is senior and there's me. And so I get a seat in the corner. I know my place in the world. He says, no, he says, come here, sit next to me. So he says to me, look, when we're gonna bring up Angola, when Gromyko says what they did, I want you to interrupt. I want you to tell him he's wrong and tell him what happened. Okay, so I'm all set. This much, is, wait, hold on. Can we just pause for a sec? Wait, so this is the height of the cold, not height, but like this is the Cold War. The cold war. This yeah. is like the front line. We're talking Angola, front lines of the Cold War. You got Kissinger, right. who's a household name at that time still. Right, Sec like, Secretary of State. It, how are you feeling going into this meeting? Like how worried, concerned? Well, I've been working with Kissinger on this for several months and he trusted me. And he knew that I was in all the U.S. government the person had most firsthand experience in what actually had happened in Angola okay. because I had been there for two years leading up to this. So he wants me to stick it to Gromyko. I don't mind that if, you know, as long as I'm instructed to do it, you don't do something like that on your own. Um, so he raises it with Gromyko. I still have the notes for this. He raises it with Gromyko. Gromyko says, I'm not going to discuss it. Kissinger raises it again, not discussing that. Okay, so here I am. It's like a scene in, in uh, Ronald Reagan movies, win one for the Gipper, I think it was. And he's on the sideline, ready to put his helmet on. Now, <laughs> coach, now. <laughs> That's exactly the way I felt. I was all set to go. I was set to confront Gramico verbally, not I mean, just saying, okay. So I didn't, because Gramico wouldn't bring it up. So that was my one. <laughs> My one, my one chance at the major leagues. Yeah. <laughs> in, I mean, I had other interesting things. But that was um, the other interesting one, which Ryan was involved in unwittingly as a nine-year-old, is 1989-1990. There's a guerrilla movement in Mozambique. And I was then stationed as the charge, the head of the U.S. Embassy in Harare, Zimbabwe. And the State Department had instructed me two months previously to initiate clandestine contact with this guerrilla leader and who was a mass murderer and as they tended to be in Africa, but to try and get this guy to back down and see what is, if there's a deal that could be reached between him and the president of Mozambique. So I had had two meetings. Um, with this guy. And it was, I, I had no instructions. It says, go and meet with him. So I made up an objective. I said, okay, I was talking to him. I said, I, what I'd like you to do is stop killing the Red Cross people. <laughs> what else could I Let's do? start out with an easy one. I start out with a, I said, nowhere in the world does any guerrilla movement kill the Red Cross. They're protected. Oh, he took him on. Yeah, okay. I'm not even sure he ever killed a Red Cross person. I'm just trying to figure out something to say to the guy. But you know, we had the three meetings. The third meeting where Ryan got involved in this, uh, he was nine years old. We were going to fly from Zimbabwe to the States. And I was going to stop in Nairobi for a clandestine meeting. These meetings all took place in different capitals around Africa. Um, so we flew in. I went to the Nairobi hotel. Uh, the Hilton Hotel in Nairobi, got a room for the night. And I told Ryan, okay, you stay in the room. You know, you can order anything you want from room service. Because I was going to be gone meeting with this guy for four to five hours. And the, the Kenyan intelligence service was setting this whole thing up. So Ryan stays, he's my wingman. He's staying in the room. And I... He decided to learn how to crack the safe in the room. <laughs> I wonder know, where my, my CIA genes came right. from. Yeah. Anyway, so I met the guy. Long story short, it actually worked out. He agreed later on, not this meeting, a subsequent meeting, to uh, meet with the president of Mozambique, that we could set up a meeting 
And this took another year. And I was then transferred to Pakistan. And I didn't carry it. But I was the one who broke the ice just to get this guy um, who was not a nice human being. But can, and he, he lived up to it. The mass, the, the slaughter was going on, uh, stopped. One of the things this guy did, by the way, he would go in and cut people's ears off. No, he would, he would kidnap kids to carry stuff they stole. And then before he sent them home, he lopped their ears off. You don't need to do that. How, how, much, of, how much of this did mom know before uh, she knew that you were taking me to this? <laughs> I, I think she knew. I don't think she realized quite how exposed you were. I mean, Nairobi's a rough city. The hotel yeah. is pretty safe. I I'm trying to imagine the cable traffic. I'm going to go have this meeting with the guy who cuts off people's ears and kills Red Cross workers. I'm going to bring my son, but he'll <laughs> stay in the hotel by right. himself. Yeah. It, yes. yes. Okay. So these things, these things happen. You know, the job I had in the foreign service was really fascinating. Um, um, okay. So I wanted to touch on, just before we wrap up here, going back to Vietnam. Yeah. So you alluded to it in 2017. Four of us go back, the brothers and you. Yeah. Had you been back there before, Dad? No, not at all. And was that the first country you went to out of the U.S.? I had gone to Canada previously, okay. but that's it. No, no yeah, that was the first one. Yeah. And you've good. been to like 85 now, right? That's right. Something right, like okay. that. So, so early on the list, Vietnam. I mean, it's yeah. really the first foreign country you've been to. Yeah. Um, we go back and we kind of retrace some of the steps, including getting into an aircraft and flying around in a helicopter over some of these areas. Yes, that's right. Having talked to some other Vietnam vets, some of them don't even want to go to the, the, the Vietnam wall in DC, let alone go back. Wow, yeah. What, um, what was it like for you going back there? Like, and would you suggest other people do that? I would suggest they did, but be, because we, you know, we had good guides and were able to get to different places, uh, that worked out very well. We got to travel up the, the Saigon River, up to the Hobo Canal, which if anybody's been in Vietnam, this is the infamous Hobo Canal, <laughs> uh, which is where the, the NVA flowed into Kuchi. Anyway, um, yeah, but, and then having a chopper for about two or three hours and flying, they wouldn't let us fly over Bearcat for reasons I don't understand, but they kept us on the other side of Saigon, which is fine. I had spent a lot of time there. We went down in the Delta. We flew over what had been the 9th Infantry Division base at Dong Tam, which is now a Vietnamese military base. We looked at that and we looked at that from about 300 feet. And you remember some of the guys on the ground came running out and were looking up yeah. at it. Okay, let's, <laughs> you know. So anyway, that, it was, it was an uh, interesting experience. We got back to Bearcat, which is where I spent a year. We couldn't get on the base. Um, we were able to walk around the perimeter um, and there was a sign in English uh, what do not do not just uh, no, like, something. yeah no trespassing basically no trespassing. Yeah, that's yeah. right yeah uh, so obviously they weren't the first guys speaking English <laughs> that had tried to walk around Bearcat and we we went to what we thought may have been the location of that midair collision the steaming right. pile that right that's the picture that I have on my computer you know the, the what do you call that your, your the screen. screensaver yeah screensaver is us standing behind us somewhere behind us half a mile two miles is roughly where the pile I mean, there's no way you could, even if we had walked in the field which i'm not going to do even if we had we couldn't have found it or identified it. i'm sure they picked everything up in the day and that was 50 yeah. years ago yeah so oh, man. okay and then one, one last story yeah. about helicopters and thinking things this happened in south africa uh, before you were born. And we had, I was at the consulate there and had an office that overlooked Durban Harbor. Durban is the biggest port in the Southern hemisphere. Okay, we got a tip off from the intelligence agencies that a, a freighter loaded with 10 Huey helicopters was coming into Durban to be diverted to Rhodesia. Now this is 1978. Rhodesia is fighting for its, which Rhodesia is the white rule government, is fighting for its survival against two black liberation movements. And they desperately needed these choppers. 
Well, they got the shoppers on the black market somewhere. It never was quite explained to me how they got them. But my job was to see if I could see from my vantage point, these helicopters coming in and then being offloaded. So I knew the name of the ship. So when it got there and I would been given, because I was doing other intelligence work for the Air Force, I was given a super duper camera, 400 millimeters. It was only about three inches long. And I would take pictures of the ship, but they, the cargo was covered with black tarpon. I couldn't 100% verify it. So I go driving past it a couple of times because it sat there for several days. And it was a windy day. The wind blew up. I had the camera, click. I got a picture of a Huey. That was it. Just so it could, and the next day, the ship was there and the Hueys were off it. So overnight, they had been offloaded onto a train and shipped up. So fast forward six years later, I go to Harare as the U.S. charge, the guy in charge of the embassy. And they're there. They're then part of the, the Zimbabwe Air Force. Because they, when the Rhodesian uh, resistance collapsed, that equipment shifted over. So it's then- circle. Yeah. So anyway, you know, here I am later on in life, I run into 10 Hueys in the middle of Africa. <laughs> So, and then even when we were in, in Vietnam, some of the Hueys that they still had on display from, oh, God, yes. from defeating the Americans, basically, yes. in there. Right. Okay. So right. we I got three things I wanted to ask you about before we head out. So yeah. one is, what, what did you think about Jamie and myself going into the military? And for me in particular, going into aviation after what we've all talked about. And I guess, when, just for those who don't know, my, my older brother, James... Um, was in, he was an armor officer, but pre 9-11. Um, myself, I was going in during Afghanistan. So there's a wartime dynamic that's a little different. Yeah. But yeah. And the oldest guy went, went, did ranger school along the yeah. way. I was in favor of it, obviously. I don't, I don't think I pushed you. But on the other hand, military had been a part of my upbringing because of Vietnam. Um, and in the foreign service, I Every year, you know, I would go to Germany for training with the reserves and I'd stayed in, in touch with it. Um, the fact that you wanted to go to aviation, you know, that's, that's interesting. Because um, I was really looking forward to your experience comparing, see how the army had changed. And it has changed a lot, mostly for the good. Most of the changes that you experienced where the army, the units got smaller, um, Training was much better. The equipment, your safety equipment, uh, your, you know, the, 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 the uh, survivability, self yeah, self-stealing gas tanks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, much better. Your training is better, and your your officers were career aviators. Yeah. Whereas in my day, they were career infantry guys who were had a second job in yeah. aviation. <laughs> yeah. So you you had and that was that was encouraging. The fact that you had mastered, the Army had mastered flying at night. We were afraid of, and with good reason, of flying yeah. at night. Your choppers had, you had more power in your watch than I had in my China chopper. Right. Just yeah. it's, you know, it changed. Okay. And that's, that's all to the good. Um, but the Huey still was an excellent, you know, in terms of maintenance, that was a great help. It's hard to beat. Out. Yeah. yeah. still fly it. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, was there anything that you carried with you in the combat that had sentimental value or a good luck charm or something that somebody gave you? Yeah, I think I gave you one. It's the Irishman's letter. You remember? Yep. Okay. Oh. And it's a letter that other Irishmen carried in the combat. I think going back to the Civil War, um, or at least World War One, And everybody who carried it survived. Well, that's like everybody no one ever come back to complain that the parachute didn't work right no, right <laughs> yeah so anyway i mean yeah i did carry that um as, as you know as sentimental um yeah and then was there i guess probably know the answer but just looking at all this that you went and did dad in vietnam and i mean the the silver star and dfc like not many people get those. You were in harm's way plenty of times. 
uh, some near misses, you know, would you have gone back and done it again if you had the chance? You know, I've listened to your programs. And most guys say, yeah, I would have done it again. Here's my issue. A lot of men died. And we failed in our objective. Um, that bothers me. It may have been, again, like Afghanistan, almost inevitable that we bit off more than we could chew as a nation. Now, here I'm talking as a political officer, foreign policy guy, as opposed to an army guy. But in my army side, I saw a lot of men die, a lot of friends. Of the 48 pilots, we had 16 killed. That's, you know, that's in a year. That's a high attrition rate. So it's, you know, oh, yeah, it'd be great to go back. And I'm really ambivalent about it just yeah. because of that, because it, it didn't succeed. And probably looking back, you know, Vietnam papers, et cetera, we should have known that earlier. You, you probably are going to get Afghan papers coming yeah. down here. God, why didn't we know that we couldn't hold this government together? I should have known that. I was a, I'm an expert, but I worked a lot on Afghanistan before 9-11. Um, and it was always considered a hopeless place then. But, but, but when you think of the camaraderie that you have, I mean, to this day, oh, you yes. meet once a year, right, with these pilots. Every, every two years. There's every six two years. Every, there's six of us. And we're all in our mid to late 70s. The CO is 82 and might have some cognitive issues coming up now. Um, but yeah, that's, that is very important to me, these men. And we work together as a unit. Our CO hammered us into an effective unit. We hadn't been when he took over. And he, he instilled a lot of leadership traits in us that had, you know, of the six, two stayed in the army. Four of us got out. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, Dad, thanks for this. We're gonna have uh, so this is the four family <laughs> event. So <laughs> we got we got my dad here, me interviewing, and then my uh, son is gonna be editing it. So he, for, go for all, go yeah. easy on the editor on this one for those listening. Is there is there any uh, X-rated stuff we have to get out before? <laughs> no, I think we're good on this one. Like, okay. Thanks a lot, Dad. Thank Thanks for listening to this combat story. As we wrap up, I just wanted to say thank you to those in the combat story community who have taken a few minutes out of your busy lives to not just listen to these stories, but also leave positive and supportive comments on Apple and YouTube. Here are some of the comments that caught my eye this week. Our first comment is from L on YouTube, and it was for the Travis Hall interview, but really for the channel in general. And it says, this channel is like therapy. There's always a new interview to listen to, and it helps fulfill a part of something that was lost after serving. I really enjoy each interview. I appreciate the channel and the time you take to interview these guys. It does a lot for veterans and civilians alike, I'm sure. I really appreciate you leaving that. I get this a lot in comments and uh, DMs from people, both vets and civilians, who find value in the show. So it's great to hear that, that you see that too. Thanks. Our second comment is on Instagram from East Coast Wolf about the David Park episode. And it says, nothing better than seeing two of your favorite podcasts come together. Combat Story and the Team House need to team up more. Great work as always. And yeah, it's so fun interviewing uh, David and Jack and then them being kind enough to have me on their show. Just having some professionals uh, walk you through even live, which is, is scary, but so much fun talking to these guys, their backgrounds and what they do today. So glad you saw it too. Thanks for leaving this. Stay safe, y'all.